Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Rare Earth panel. My name is Thomas Krummer of the company GITI in Singapore, a uh, minor metals and rare earth um, consulting company. Um, we have today a very high caliber uh, panel here, starting with the lady, it is uh, Jessie Chen. She's a director of Long State Investments Limited. Longstate is a private investment company specializes in investing and funding growth-oriented companies globally. Then we have uh, Philip Koslowski. He's the CEO of Leading Edge Materials. Leading Edge Materials is a, a Canadian public company with its shares listed in Canada and Stockholm. The company is developing the, its uh, NoraCare Heavy Rare Earth Project in Sweden. The only rare earth project of note within the borders of the European Union. Then we have uh, Paul Esserle, he's the chairman of Pensana Rare Earth uh, PLC. Pensana Rare Earth is a UK listed company that is studying the establishment of a rare earth oxide processing facility in one of the three Northern Powerhouse Freeport locations in the UK as part of a sustainable mine to magnet supply chain. Then we have uh, Ryan Castillo, uh, Managing Director of Adamas Intelligence. Adamas Intelligence is uh, one of the principal research and consulting companies in the rare earth and battery material space, offering unbiased analysis and forecasts. Then we have uh, Daniel Mamadou. He's the executive director of Talaxis Limited, and he is also the co-head of technology metals at Noble Group. Talaxis is a member of Lo Noble Group, one of the world's most important supply chain managers in resource, resource industries. Talaxis are shareholders in several rare earth projects. And last but not least, we have Dr. Nabil Mancheri. He's the Secretary General of the Rare Earth Industry Association. The Rare Earth Industries Association is the only supranational representation of the global rare earth industry with members from all over the world, and that includes China. Um, before we get into the details of rare earth, maybe Jesse, if, if you could give us an idea um, why, in general terms, your uh, company and the general market has become more interested in rare earths recently? Thank you, Thomas. And the uh, economic recovery investment theme that seems has now become consensus as positive news on vaccine and uh, has been released and also on the back of the uh, current strong microeconomic condition and along with the potential for future QE, we see the surge in the market and we expect a strong recovery and economic expansion in 2021. And we think the junior mining space, there are a few sectors that we are particularly bullish about. Battery mirror, including lithium, graphite, nickel, rare earth, but commodity like iron ore and base metal like copper. And uh, when which will benefit uh, significantly from the economic rebound and also be supported by the strong demand in the future. However, across the resources space, there have been a lot of money investing into the junior space, and we have seen a lot of valuations go sky high. Because of that, we have been very carefully looking at the fundamental of the company. If there is any market correction, we can still be confident that our investment would stand the uh, downturn. Um, rare earth opportunities from an investor's perspective is, is significantly more complicated than a gold and a silver story. Expectations for investors are projects that are economically viable and potential to move for, for, from the uh, greenfield into the production. And we need to understand that project which project can offer the uh, high value rare earth as well. And when we look at the rare earth projects that which are more chemistry problem as opposed to simple to one or two commodities, uh, we need to demonstrate if the company is able to provide and separate the uh, valuable and also marketable rare earth oxide. Lastly, as an investor, 
we become much more focused on sustainable and environmental cautious companies. And we understand that many rare earth projects have harmful byproducts such as uranium and thorium. And so we try to understand how company can address that question as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nabil, could you walk us through uh, very briefly what rare earth elements are and why they are important? What are they used for? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for a nice introduction. And to start with, uh, rare earths are 17 elements in the periodic table, perhaps we all studied in the, in the high school. And, and the table, and in the, in the periodic table in the lanthanide series, they are called. Uh, they are further divided as light rare earths and heavy rare earths based on their atomic weight or number. Uh, these days they are called industrial vitamins as they are indispensable in many modern technologies, including defense applications. And by quantity wise, the elements called lanthanum and cerium are widely used in sectors such as oil refining, auto catalyst, glass and ceramic industry. And, and, but by the value terms, the elements such as neodymium, praseodymium, dysprosium, terbium, and samarium are used uh, in, for making magnets. Uh, these magnets are used in a wide variety of applications, especially in electric motors of wind turbines and electric cars, electronics, robotics, water and industrial pumps, speakers, including you know, loudspeakers and small speakers. And uh, on defense side, because that's very important and strategically important, uh, on different side, they are used in fighter jets such as US F-35 or, or in missiles, radars, you know, in night vision goggles, space launch vehicles, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ryan, could you give us an idea of the global market size in terms of dollars and tons of, of rare earth? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you, Thomas. In 2019, the total global market amounted to some 200, <clears throat> excuse me, 200,000 tons of total rare earth oxide worth approximately 4 billion US dollars. Of this total amount, roughly 70% came out of the ground in China with the net coming primarily from Australia, the US, Myanmar, and a handful of other smaller producing nations while 90% of the 200,000 tons that came out of the ground was processed into individual rare earth oxides, metals, alloys, magnets, and other value added products within China. So while there's been some global diversification on the upstream end of the supply chain, in recent years, China still remains the dominant value adder across the supply chain and will remain such for the foreseeable future. Um, on the demand side of the market, as Nabil alluded to, by volume, approximately 60% of global total rare earth oxide consumption each year is driven by applications involving rare earth permanent magnets, as well as catalysts. However, 90% of the total value of global rare earth oxide consumption each year is driven by applications involving permanent magnets alone. And this already large portion is expected to get even larger in the future as both demand for and prices of neodymium, praseodymium, dysprosium, and terbium continue to rise strongly in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Daniel, um, could you perhaps give us an idea in general of the trade flows of rare earths, the raw materials and the finished products? Yes. Uh, hi, Thomas. Good evening and good evening, good evening everyone. Um, in, in terms of the trade flows currently, what is happening in the market is China being the largest uh, um, demand market currently, there's a significant amount of uh, domestic uh, supply uh, taking place. And then outside of China, uh, after examining uh, custom records, we've essentially identified different sources that include countries such as Brazil, uh, but also um, a couple of African countries that include Nigeria, 
of course, Myanmar, which I think has been mentioned earlier, and, and Malaysia, uh, where we've also got a significant um, source, of, uh, source of rare earth. Now, this is I would, as it stands today, and, and I'm probably leaving uh, a number of other potential sources out, out there, but this is as it stands today. Now, going forward, we, we would expect um, the number of uh, producer countries to increase as uh, we see pipelines, pipeline projects coming, coming, um, coming online. Uh, and you know, uh, th that is when we talk about you know, hard rock projects, um, and I think we shouldn't forget the potential sources that are represented by tailings of uh, other mining operations out there, uh, which depending on how regulation and, and transportation rules evolve, could potentially increase and open the door to a significant addition of uh, supply volumes onto the market. Right, thank you very much. Um, Philip, you, in, uh, you emphasized in your introduction that you have a heavy rare earth project in uh, Sweden, in Nora Care. Um, can, can you give us a little bit of an introduction what your project is about and why you call it a heavy rare earth project? Sure. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon from Stockholm. So Nora Share Heavy rare Earth project was uh, started really by our company in 2009, but it's, it's a it's a well-known geological uh, deposit for over 100 years in Sweden. Uh, and uh, why, why it's a heavy rare earth deposit is because uh, we have more than 50% of the rare earth, uh, rare earth in our deposit are of the heavy type. Uh, and you know, specifically enriched with the dysprosium, where in our TFS from 2015, 45 percent of the revenue was from dysprosium alone. So you could even push it to calling it a dysprosium project, but uh, we call it a heavier project. And uh, uh, so it's unique in that sense. And you know, another unique aspect of the project is that it's uh, one of the it's the only project of its kind within the borders of the European Union. And it's by been identified by the European Parliament to be one of the projects that could solve the European Union's needs for many of these rare earth elements in the past. So we started working on the project in 2009, and, you know, with the boom years in rare earth elements uh, in the subsequent years, quite rapid progress was made on the project with uh, 20,000 meters of drilling, uh, PEA 2012, mining lease granted in 2013, uh, and then the PFS in 2015. And I guess uh, where it sort of you know, halted a bit for the project was in 2016, where there was a ruling from the Supreme Administrative Court, uh, you know, actually overturning the, the previously granted mining lease. And the, this was due to a new interpretation of the, the interplay between the Mining Act and the Environmental Act. And I think this is a you know, fundamental backdrop of where sustainability is, uh, being given, uh, given a heavier weight in, in the discussion around mining. Um, so uh, combined with a, uh, in a market in a downturn, uh, you know, the, the project started sort of moving slowly. But uh, what we have been able to do is you know, further develop uh, on, the, on the technical side, um, you know, spend more time looking at the resource efficiency of the project and how we can minimize the uh, minimize the local environmental footprint of the project in order to move it forward in, in the permitting process. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has accelerated with the, you know, with the increased focus on rare earths over the last 12 months. Uh, we had a change in the company with the new board of directors, which is now European, uh, very much uh, with the majority of Swedish citizens, myself being a Swedish citizen, taking over as CEO. Uh, we did the capital raise this summer, and we're now deploying that towards the PEA, where we're looking at, you know, in specific, the resource efficiency. What can we do to make the project more feasible from a sustainability standpoint uh, in order to move it forward in the permitting process? And by, you know, we're doing that through, uh, you know, we, we think is a pretty uh, easy way, which is 65% of the material that, that was mined in the, in the previous design is an ethylene cyanide product, which you know, has a potential industrial minerals application. Uh, so we're trying to define how the project would look like if we treat that 65% that was previously considered waste, we treat it as a product instead. Uh, what do we see as associated byproduct revenues, uh, lower the costs for waste treatment, uh, lower capex for the tailings facility and so on. Mm. 
Okay. Um, Paul, uh, Philip has a heavy rare earth project. Um, I think one can say uh, Pensana have a light rare earth project. Could you tell us a little bit about your Longondro project and the plans that you have for separation in the UK? Thanks, Thomas. Thanks to the previous speakers. It's a very helpful introduction to, to the sector. And thanks particularly to Jesse for mentioning this key issue of a sustainability. So as Thomas has mentioned, we're one of the new uh, projects hoping to come online, the Long Gonjo Carbonate project, Carbonatite project in, uh, in Angola. And we brought the project to the point where we know we can produce a, a mixed rare earth carbonate. We're also looking at a mixed rare earth sulfate. And we know, as uh, previous speakers have indicated, there's a strong market for both of those in China. We're looking to see whether in the current, what we think will be the future environment, that it will be harder and harder to mine and develop unsustainably and bring into the European Union uh, products that don't fit certain criteria. So uh, the Green Deal and the, the, the European Commission has come out very clearly and say it's no longer acceptable to mine unsustainably, bring it into the European Union, the European Europe Raw Materials Association being set up to, Alliance being set up to, to look at that. And we're talking about carbon border taxes and all sorts of restrictions. So that caused us to then look at to see whether we can establish a UK-based uh, railroad separation facility. And we've appointed the Wood Group who um, are advancing their studies. We've got three potential locations in ports. There are three ports um, in existing chemical uh, processing uh, parks in the UK to see whether we can take at least some of our product to the UK and then become linked with others and create a mine to magnet a sustainable mines and magnet supply chain to meet what we think with the growing demand, the weight of demand will, we think, will come more and more from Europe. So for instance, 40% of the offshore wind turbines in the world right now are in the European Union and that's going to increase fivefold. And we're seeing what Germany and the UK is playing catch up on happening with electric vehicles. So we think there will be a growing market within the European Union as part of the Green Deal. And we think there will be a market for identifiably sustainable supply chain for uh, the rare earth, the rare earth products that feed that magnet metal supply chain. Mm. Right. Uh, so say uh, from, from a timeline perspective, where would you see the start of production from uh, Longonjo and where would you see, when would you see a finished uh, separation project in, in England? Well, we've announced um, just, just this, um, we've just recently announced that we're looking to break ground uh, first quarter next year and also announced that the planning uh, permissions that were required for the facility in the UK can be achieved in time for the facility in the UK to be constructed contemporaneously with the mine in Angola. So if in a very broadly, because these numbers aren't announced, these dates aren't announced, but very broadly, if we look to finish all our studies and have our financing in place by the middle of next year, then it's a 12 month build with approximately six to another six to 12 month commissioning period for both, that is for the mine and for the rare earth processing facility. So specific answer to your question, without it being formally announced, as in that's what we're targeting, we will announce that more formally, that is we'll finalize our current studies to indicate whether that's possible when the wood group studies are finalized in the middle of January. Mm. Thank you. So Nabil, um, you are the expert. Uh, a couple of years ago, you did uh, trailblazing research on the uh, application and consumption of rare earths in the European Union. Um, would you also see the, the regulatory uh, environment changing the, the um, imports from China into a domestic supply of, of rare earths in the European Union? Yes, in, uh, thank you, Thomas. Yes, indeed. Uh, in fact, there was a discussion today morning involving European Commission and some government agencies from Australia, and the key focus was on the sustainability. And I'm happy that all our junior partners also 
you know pick up that issue of sustainable production and processing uh, and also you know the investment community like Jesse highlighted that, that so the regulation is a key issue that how you produce how you measure the sustainability and, and as a global association and having members you know across the countries across the value chain uh, uh, and to have a unified voice is a bit challenging so how you measure sustainability to you know to to bring everyone together and and you know connect them with the what uh, with the government agencies uh, and, and 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 to communicate you know what is exactly coming from the regulatory side uh, so we act uh, we try to fill this gap by setting up a unified global stakeholder uh, network and try to find a voice for the RE industry about their concerns you know including you know what 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 philip said what the concerns they had in the sweden you know regarding the the, the licensing issues uh, and on your uh, specific questions uh, we are indeed connected uh, to the all major government agencies uh, and, and uh, we we are acting as an information provider on on sustainability and setting the standard in the rare earth industry and we didn't have an industry body before to state the standard on on sustainability and this is basically looking at the you know life cycle assessment so our key priority is is on the sustainability uh, and, and and we you know we we our main principle is that you know even uh, paul mentioned that you know based on the esg you know uh, principles so and and the junior companies are much more open to adapt to these you know government requirements rather than previously so, so there's a well you know well connection between these groups we ensure that yeah thank you right. um ryan i mean we are, we are talking about the supply side all the time but uh, what about the large end users the industrial end users of rare earth in the west say the, the the oil refiners or the catalyst manufacturers the glass industry uh, do they really care about sustainability and, and would they accept higher prices if the product was made closer to home? Yeah, That's, it's a great question and one that I think echoes throughout, throughout minds of anybody following this space. The, the truth is at this point in time, I would say no. That they do care, perhaps, yeah. Uh, no is maybe not the right, the right answer. They, they do indeed care but not yet so to the point that they're willing to take action on it, that they're willing to pay a premium to have that sustainable, transparent source of supply. Um, I think many of the moral messages that large corporations put forward lead us to believe that they are heading in that direction and that maybe if we consider electric vehicles that rare earths are still just being prioritized a little bit lower than uh, materials like those that go into the battery in terms of addressing those issues. So. Um, I'm confident that once, you know, cobalt related issues and nickel related issues um, are addressed that rare earths will, will, will be next in line um, to be promoted as, as, uh, as being more sustainable, more transparent. Um, broadly speaking, there are no doubt concerns by end users with respect to, to rare earths, but it's, it's a hard generalization to make. Those concerns will certainly vary by geography and also by industry. Um, if we consider the automotive industry, for example, in China, there's virtually no concerns about current or future availability of rare earth supplies. But if we contrast that with Japan, let's say, um, there are substantial concerns with respect to availability of certain rare earths, namely dysprosium and terbium, because China supplies virtually 100% of, of the market for those materials. Um, in Europe, which is a little bit more forward looking, a little bit more conservative, um, there's absolutely concerns about availability of supply, about transparency into the single source opaque supply chain. And that's led automakers like BMW, um, Jaguar, Renault, and others to, to use um, alternative rare earth free traction motors in their latest electric vehicles um, as a hedge against that risk, despite those motors being less efficient than, than those that would use rare earths. Um, and in the US, we see undulating concerns with respect to rare earths, um, often rooted in the fact that the defense industry in the U.S. is almost entirely reliant on China for, for rare earth supplies, and also rooted in the kind of ongoing political jousting that's happening between China and the U.S. So 
Indeed, there are concerns about, uh, about rare earths, about transparency, but they vary by region, by sector, and, and almost certainly by company within those sectors themselves. Thomas, Thomas, if I could just speak to that, just very pick up on the point that Ryan make, and I know could we fully understand um, it'll be regional, as Ryan says, but the European Union uh, Commission is very, very clear. There's the EU taxonomy on sustainable investment. It's not just the consumer, but the investors, the shareholders in those companies are going to be held to account if they don't demonstrate the supply chains are sustainable. So this is where Jesse's feeling it. Jesse's very, very well aware that it's not just the ESG funds, all funds now are gonna be held to account on sustainable investment. So the access to capital for all of these companies, their shareholders are gonna be putting pressure on, not just the consumers, not the raw material purchasers, but the shareholders. So we, th we think it will be legislatively driven, particularly in Europe, and it'll, it's, it, every day it's increasing. Well said, Paul. Thanks for adding that. Maybe I can just add to that. And I know Jessie sitting there, she knows what I'm about to say, but the thing is in like 45 trillion US dollars flowed into ESG funds and ESG journalist funds. And uh, they're going to invest in the new economy, the Green New Deal, the Green Deal. These Green Deals, are, as Ryan's pointed out in his reports, great reports, basically they're driven by these technology metals. The, the question is, you can't have a green economy if the, if the technology metals are not sustainably sourced. So I, I'm with Jesse. I think the capital, mar capital markets will drive it. Capital markets will selectively pick companies and say, you can demonstrate that your product is sustainably constructed, developed, and each of the supply chains, and we've, and as Ryan's pointed out, we've seen it in many other sectors, you know, Glencore's, Rio Tinto, BHP, you name them, they're getting an absolute bashing for any aspect of their operations that don't fit sustainability guidelines, and that's before the legislation comes in. So it's definitely a trend that I think um, and I've been sitting to his comment, but certainly, certainly in, in Europe, it's a, it's a very strong trend backed by large amounts of money. I finally managed to unmute myself and would like to, to balance the comment about uh, you know, whether the end customers are willing to pay more for sustainable products. You know, uh, it, it might actually not be a choice for them really because what, what you're seeing in the European Union with, for example, discussions around the carbon border tax and you know, this is very much focused on the battery materials now, but where the European Union essentially is saying that, you know, we put very high requirements on the materials that we want to be mined and used in the European Union. There's not going to be any shortcuts for other regions to import materials, export materials into the European Union based on lower requirements. Uh, and when you look at that way, you know, there's a clear potential that there will be increasing costs for the customers anyway. Uh, and that is what sort of the buzzword is within the European Union is about leveling the playing field for the European industry uh, on a global scale. I think that is. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, there's another question that I would have to anyone who would want to answer it. But my impression is that if we start producing in the US or in the European Union and turn out thousands of tons of neodymium praseodymium, we might actually not have the local market who takes that product. Where are the permanent magnet makers in the European Union that need a thousand tons of NDPR? The biggest one is importing from his own joint venture in Beijing, as Paul certainly knows. <laughs> well, if I, if, I, if I can answer that in a generality, because yeah. I don't want to speak yeah. to the companies themselves, but as you well know, Thomas, the midstream and downstream companies in and Europe are actually actively looking at this. They, they recognize there's a growing market in the EV space and the offshore potential offshore wind turbine space. Mm. Um, to, to, and that's the, the UK government's out there at the moment talking about creating a mine to magnet supply chain because you know the, the biggest developments in offshore wind turbines are off the north coast of uh, Yorkshire. 40% uh, of the world's offshore wind is in, is in Europe big part of that is in the UK and yet most of those offshore wind turbines are made either in Europe or somewhere else and imported so UK is turning around and saying okay let's see if we can become not just make the blades for the 
wind turbines. Let's see if we can be part of that, that supply chain. And exactly the same thing on the electric vehicles. So I think you've got to look at it, and Daniel knows this better than I do, but you think you look at supply chains in totality and see what's happening, not look at what's there today, look at what's going to be there in two years' time. Um, driven by, as Philippe's pointed out, is the, this sustainability legislation. It's going to create a situation where these industries can create, can, can be developed and expanded to, to create that market, as you say, Thomas, that right now currently doesn't exist. Mm. So Daniel, what is, what is your opinion? You are invested in uh, several rare earth projects, hopeful projects um, that will come on stream one of these days. Um, how will you want to place the product? Yeah, so I mean, okay. do you see the end use? I tend to agree with Paul, right? So mm. when you look at Noble Group, we trade, we trade commodities, we trade, we trade carbon steel material, we trade energy coal, we trade LNG, we trade base metals, as well as technology metals. And uh, typically, market participants tend to follow regulation, right? So in the, in the particular case of rare earth, where there's been almost no new investment upstream in the past decade, except in very specific occasions and not always successfully, a good example has been, you know, Linus. It's it's had its full start and eventually its 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 success. Uh, you know, we we're, we're seeing now a rebirth of, uh, I guess, the Californian rare earth industry with uh, the listing today. In fact, of uh, uh, MP material that is doing a business combination with with a SPAC, Fortress Value Acquisition. So, this is big capital, and and capital needs certainty. Right, money is fickle. Uh, investors uh, and you know uh, institutional investors like to, if they are to invest in upstream uh, upstream production projects that take, you know, half a decade to a decade to kind of come on stream. You you need that certainty of uh, regulation, that certainty that creates a market and and forces demand, if you like, uh, for for the product. Now, you know. Um, with, with um, uh, the European Union announcing its new Green Deal at the beginning of this year, towards the end of last year, beginning of this year, then on top of that, we have, we've had COVID. That's, if anything, it, it has slowed everything down, but it also has, I think, uh, it, it's, it's made everyone realize that geographic focus uh, uh, is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, yes, you can optimize supply chains, to the point of being the cheapest uh, uh, and most efficient path possible, but that comes at a cost, and that cost is a lack of diversification, which essentially, uh, when you most need it in a time of crisis or, or in a time of disruption, you don't have a hedging mechanism, you don't have an alternative. And so I think um, these regulations, at least in the European Union, are being right now um, um, framed into laws or directives, as we call them in Europe, that will then eventually become laws in in uh, within the respective uh, countries that form part of the union, and that, from our perspective, we feel will essentially unlock the flow of capital. Now, our personal experience at Talaxis, we we position ourselves early on, uh, you know. Um, very early, in, in fact, it's, it's been you know our first foray into rare earth uh, took place in 2017. So you know we're talking about three years, but you know three years it is a long time if you have a very short term uh, view and approach to the market. At the same time, three years is is a very short time within the life cycle of a mining project, uh, and, and I'm sure. You know, uh, Philip here, or, or in fact, everyone who's involved in in the business will recognize that fact. So, um, it, it is you know, it is not easy to uh, position yourself at a flick of a finger. You, it, it takes time. Uh, capital follows its own path, um, and you know, the size of the, the the capex that we're talking about in in the industry are not they're not 
as large as what you would see in the oil and gas space, but they're, they're, they are large non, nonetheless, right? So we're always talking about at least a couple of hundred million dollars or, or, or more. And, and we're also talking about a very specialized field that combines metallurgy with, you know, chemistry um, uh, and, and where there's been, frankly speaking, outside of China, there's not been as much uh, uh, work and development from an R&D perspective as uh, we would have, you know, desired. Um, Ryan, maybe uh, from your perspective, would you uh, agree that it is very likely that with regulation um, there will be investment in rare earth and its downstream industries or Will it be like regulation we've seen in chemicals in the European Union that uh, eventually the current suppliers like China become compliant and there's no longer an issue to import? How would you see this? Yeah, I, I think the, the truth will be somewhere in between. So we expect that we will indeed see investment in the rare earth space, both, both upstream and downstream outside of China throughout the coming decade. Um, and also we'll see investment within China, um, all driven by, by regulation. The, the real question is um, whether the investment on both ends will, will catalyze enough development to meet the strong demand growth that we're, we're seeing in the years ahead. Um, so throughout the, the, the past speakers we've seen, there's a number of chicken and egg dilemmas. Um, firstly, the industry has been battling with uh, the, the lack of separation capacity outside of China to treat potential mine concentrates that, that may be produced. Um, and now it looks like we're on the cusp of potentially solving that dilemma uh, on a number of fronts, but we're looking further downstream at gaps in metals making, in magnet making, et cetera. So it, it's, it's encouraging to see traction, you know, at the upstream end of the supply chain, which we believe will translate into investments downstream in that metal making, in that magnet making, et cetera, and, and help further diversify um, that supply chain. But I would just like to add, I think something that's, that's kind of come to the surface through, through the last speakers um, is, is the risk that we have uh, by relying so heavily on a single source of supply. And that while we're looking to diversify the supply chain, there's a danger that we further polarize those, those, those different entities. And uh, ultimately that's going to translate into greater problems than, than we're even facing today given that we don't see any alternative that could come in and entirely fill China's shoes in the near term. So it's key that as we look to diversify, that this doesn't foster polarization, that it in fact fosters greater cooperation by all major stakeholders in the industry or else the house of cards will quickly come, come falling down. Thank you. So in terms of um, permanent magnets, um, you made some forecasts. What is your forecast 2025? What is your forecast 2030 for the growth rate? Yeah, the, the growth rate over the next couple of years will be quite strong. Uh, we anticipate that demand this year will fall by approximately 10% on account of the ongoing negative effects of the pandemic. But we expect that that will rebound strongly throughout the end of this year into 2021 and 2022. Um, with double digit growth rates in 2021 and 2022. Thereafter, we expect demand to grow by approximately 10% annually through the end of the decade. And where that brings us relative to today is a more than doubling of demand for the four magnet rares, the neodymium, praseodymium, dysprosium, and terbium. And all, all things being considered equal, means that the global industry needs to more than double its total rare earth oxide production within just a 10 year window in order to meet that rapid demand growth for the, the permanent magnet related elements. So a formidable challenge to do so in such a, a short time, given the investment dollars that are needed, the lead times that, are, that, 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 that come about with development of such projects. Mm. I see, Philip, lead time. Assume that all regulatory hurdles are out of the way and you would get financing. You, if you can start today, when would you be able to supply the first separated rare earth oxides? That's, that's, that's a bit of a trick question, isn't it? Based, no, based on previous discussion. 
Let us just assume everything is Goldilocks. All regulations. Well, I mean, and, and that bases the assumption that we also have the downstream processes, because if we are assuming yeah. that we want to settle into Europe, uh, hmm. okay, so you mean even assuming that the downstream, um, yeah. it's, uh, it's very hard to say, but I would say, you know, the European Commission is looking for projects that could be operational by 2025. Um, assuming and, and everything is done, that, that yeah. is outside our control. Yes. That is doable, yes. That's possible. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. And, and, and I, think, I think on, on that point, which, you know, I wanted to make earlier as well, you know, mm. I'm not concerned at all about the European Union not solving the downstream. I mean, look at what they've done with the battery industry in Europe. When they launched the Battery Alliance in 2017, the battery industry in Europe was non-existent. And just look at the announced capacity that is being built and you know how that is feeding into you know the car makers as well you know looking to to move to electric vehicles catl china invested excuse me catl china invested that's yeah that's correct so you know it, it's not yeah. it's not isolated for the european union but uh, northwold is very much a perfect example of how it can work where you, you know, early on, you have public investment, de-risking an investment, just essentially opening the floodgates to private money uh, mm -hmm. and making that happen. And, and it's, you know, 100% based on access to, you know, uh, sustainable power, uh, you know, located in Sweden. So I think, uh, yeah, don't underestimate, like, you know, I think a very wise, wise man told me, uh, politics trumps economics. So um, <laughs> I think that's what we're seeing here now as well. Yeah. Nabil, um, you are in Brussels, you are in very close contact with the uh, European Commission. How likely would you see it uh, that hurdles that cannot be overcome by, say, companies like LEM um, would be eased or removed in order to get a local supply of rare earths? Yeah. Uh... You are right. Uh, we are a base, uh, Brussels-based association, and and we support, you know, as an industry, but global industry body, we 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 support any national or regional initiative that align with our core objective of developing a sustainable and transparent RE value chain. To say that, you know, recently that that European Commission has come up with an an idea of alliance, you know, like the battery alliance, they have the raw material alliance. And we were very much part of that initial discussions. And so a kind of, we, we enabled bringing our, you know, members to this kind of island regional. It's not only about Europe, it's also about if, if similar thing comes up in, in any other countries. And for example, we are also connected, uh, you know, uh, in discussion with promoting our own members like, you know, Natural Resource Canada, one of the government agency who promote the investment in Canada uh, and also Sure, for you know EIT raw materials in Europe, and also we are in touch with you know research and R&D aspects uh, or funding of the DOI through CMI, Critical Material Institute, or in fact Jogmec is our member, and Jogmec has interest in a couple of you know rare earth projects, including the recent one in Africa, and and we are you know connecting them with a couple of others, you know whether they are interested to develop an alternate source, and. And Jogmec, and, and also recently we have seen, you know, Austrade, you know, taking proactive role in technology metals. And we had several discussion with Austrade, how the Australian companies can, you know, uh, find finance or how to connect the invest. So, so we are, you know, facilitating this kind of discussion with the government agencies. Yeah. Thank you. So Jesse, if you listen to all this, what is your feeling as an investor? Are you getting bullish? Yes, so uh, thank you, Thomas. So sitting in this panel, I, I, I feel like very confident and uh, bullish about the uh, rare earth, as I mentioned uh, before. And uh, obviously, Pensana is one of my top lists within the uh, rare earth space. And congrats to uh, Paul on the outstanding uh, performance of the shares. And together with the uh, receiving further investment from uh, Angolan Sovereign Wealth Fund. Also, I'm very impressed with the uh, Philip Heavy uh, rare earth project as well. And I'm uh, keen to learn more about that project as well. Mm, thank you very much. Yeah, I think that uh, we basically touched on all the major points that uh, concern rare earth. 
um, from the source, from the mine, through the processing to the finished products, market sizes, the participants, the trade flows, and the concrete projects that we have here on, on the panel today. So I would like to thank you very much for being here today. It was a great honor and a pleasure to talk to all of you and uh, hope to see you soon again, uh, maybe in person and no longer separated digitally in order not to catch a virus. Yeah? Thank you very much for coming. Thank, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, thank you very much, thank everyone. You. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks.